You know, if we, if we didn't know already, the past year has shown us that these business issues related to cross-media measurement and data are as important, if not more so, than the technical ones. So our next panel, who also are not shy, um, will help us better understand those issues. So let's give a warm welcome to Jason Lynch, Senior Editor uh, for TV at Adweek, who will introduce his panelists of buyers and sellers. All right, uh, hi everybody. I'm just very thrilled not to have an excuse to have an excuse to talk about something other than the Super Bowl this week. So uh, we have a great panel. So we have Joe Marchese, who is the uh, yeah, I got my phone with me and everything. Yeah, ad sales great. chief for Fox Networks Group. We've got Scott from Heart Science. CEO, Hello. And we've got Lou from Bank of America. So we have a, a lot to talk about. Um, so. First off, you know, we, we finally got through January, even though it seems like the, the longest month in history. Um, but we're still <laughs> at the beginning of 2018. As you look ahead to this year, what are your measurement priorities and, and what's still lacking out there? Well, yeah, so for us at Bank of America, you know, we're really kind of digging in on all those things that uh, Rashad was saying might not really be important, like relationships and uh, <laughs> I tweeted out the Tylenol quote, realizing my boss is going to see that, and then she's going to question why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, no, but you know, I think the tectonic shift that we're in the midst of, right, is we're moving from this one-to-many model, which has served us well for 60 years, to a one-to-one -one model, uh, in order to compete for attention, right? And in order to do that, we need to get far more. Um, information around what matters to people. We like to say at Bank of America, we're trying to engineer relevance in every interaction. So we're looking for a deterministic, high fidelity signal and trying to use that to make our content more desirable. So, sorry, Suzanne, I like the word content. Uh, so that people engage with it more. And you know, it, requ it requires a much deeper understanding of customer lifetime value and a move away from those sort of performance metrics around transactions, which are sort of false gods in where we're going. Relationships do matter, I think, and it's a customer over a long time where you're going to find true ROI in your marketing investment. I sell commercials. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought, I thought it was my turn. <laughs> or there's that. Hit it, man. Go, go for it. No, I, I, what do we want to measure this year? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of did this crazy epiphany that um, uh, you know some of our favorite conversations between the networks and the agencies is the constant refrain of why am I paying more for less? There's less audience there. Why am I paying more for it? I kind of I've got a chart, and I'll eventually I'm going to make a chart so you guys can see it. Instead, I'll, do, I'll use my hands for the moment. But like uh, here's about like the cost of an average CPM rate, you know, over time. Here's the cost per rating point for us, like how much it costs to make a show to get one rating point. But here's the cost per rating point where they're watching it in an ad-supported environment because they watch it on DVR. So like the cost per like rating point of someone watching ad-supported television is skyrocketing. So I think you know we're getting a pretty good deal in television these days. So by Thursday You're night. You're psyched, football. man. You're psyched. <laughs> uh, my point of view is like the, and I'm kind of with Rashad, that the point of market entry for uh, consumers now has fundamentally changed and continues to change because of voice potentially and, and voice enabled search starting to take on a dominant point of market entry, especially with younger generations. And I think the concept of a uh, measuring a funnel moving from awareness to consideration to transaction is archaic and that potentially we need to start thinking about how people potentially are entering into the funnel at a very rational point, especially in the era of a lot of fake news and bullshit content that I actually there might directly go in and start researching what features or what functionality are most important against the cost of a product or in the case of Amazon, maybe enter in directly at the transactional level. And in that instance, we have to kind of rebalance everything we've thought about relative to attribution that it may not be as linear as we previously thought. And I think that's the, I mean, that's the, that's the thing is like we'll, we'll, we'll get into the attribution conversation and, and Lou can hit me over the head halfway through, but like the, like I just, I, I just think that the, the, the lie of attribution, like the, the, the thing we tell ourselves is possible because we're uncomfortable with the fact that the human brain is a little more complicated than these four impressions led to the person buying an $18,000 automobile. It's like, 
Okay, well, what about those other impressions for the other automobiles? Was there negative attribution to it? Like, there's something, there's something that like we just want so badly for this all to be easy. But truth totally. is, like, brands are built with cultural relevance, and then that becomes your profit margin. I love the uh, concept of negative attribution because, like, if you now, if we were not buying quality content from uh, Fox, and sometimes we're ending up in some UGC places, rubbing shoulders with UGC might actually provide you negative reach. Where the content is so bad that it's actually YouTube working in the wrong about direction. <laughs> oh. We're in a very weird attribution right now. So it would be like advertiser, publisher, guy in the middle, <laughs> and we're like, this is it. This is the ultimate of right. non-like yeah. linear yeah. attribution. Right. They're but selling to me. I, I'm going to resell it to him. I, you know, I do understand your point, Joe. Uh, and I'll say this at the outset: we're all friends, so this will probably get interesting now. Um, within the context of what we all do in this room. But you know, as a buyer, I will tell you that my role inside of Bank of America is not unlike, if you remember The Wizard of Oz, for those three or four people who are old enough to remember it, I'm the guy on the screen. There's somebody else behind the curtain pulling the levers. Spoiler alert, and spoiler alert. All you have to do I is say your mouth. And right? I been, so there's a CFO, right? And the CFO questions everything. And so all of my peers in the bank, the guy that runs retail banking, the people that run Merrill Lynch, all the other platforms, they've got really rigorous ROI. And no longer can I go in and say, guess what? You know, it's a cultural imperative that drives brands to achieve. It doesn't compete. So we do have to change the modality to keep up with the rest of the enterprise because I'm in a competition for dollars inside the company and so is everyone else in marketing. These conversations about, well, we're going to switch it from TV to digital. No, we're going to switch it from advertising to not advertising because I don't have a high fidelity way on a customer by customer basis to illustrate how the dollars that I'm investing are actually driving business outcomes. Now, I grew up in this business, right? I believe fervently that what we do does in fact drive the business. But if we can't prove it in a way that is as high fidelity as the other parts of the business, we're gonna, see, we're gonna be able to fit in smaller rooms over the next five years. It's not a good place to be. I think Rashad is absolutely right. You're gonna see a decline of 30%, and part of it is because market, brand, brand marketers are seeing less value in advertising versus other opportunities. They see less value in a short term uh, than other opportunities, and yet the You're brands will accrue all of the yeah the brands will accrue all of the value over the long term. So like if we go to a voice search world, as Scott was talking about, like and it says Amazon get me batteries uh, mm -hmm. or Alexa, I think is what you say, or or OK Google. Let's see if I set off a couple people's phones. <laughs> the, uh, but like you know, get me batteries versus OK Google get me Duracell. The difference in price is the profit margin. The the thing that triggered a human brain to say Duracell instead Ooh. of batteries, but. If we move to a pure attribution model, platforms accrue all the value, 100% of the value, right? Like it just you, you go to utility, brands don't matter anymore, platforms own the value. I think you're looking at it from a linear perspective where your attribution is That's through regression. That's crazy idea. <laughs> no, but, but your attribution is not always going to be through regression. Your platform is going to get delivered on a 5G environment, and you're going to be able to measure deterministically. And, and at that point, I can absolutely say that my upper funnel advertising has a down funnel effect and is driving the Alexa search. So. That, I think that future is three, four, five years away. All right, so uh, since we are here to talk about cross-platform <laughs> measurement, and uh, although this is fun. Yeah, I he, swore, he, swore, he swore on the phone call yesterday <laughs> that he was going to interrupt us when we went on, and uh, just so you know, I'm calling bullshit. Um, there's whiskey in here. So how, how and there, there's been get? so much talk over the last couple of years about we need cross-platform metrics, we need apples-to-apples -apples measurement of what's happening on digital and what's happening on linear. How critical do you feel it is to develop those, and how close are we right now? I think it's a ways out. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and I think as soon as we uh, we get to the reality of it's all connected, and we have one universal ID that synthesizes it all, like it was like trying to watch Canoe happen, and knowing that the physical plant underneath all the cable companies was never going to be able to be interoperable, <coughs> and then everything became a series of hacks, which is where we stand right now. Like the, the nasty side of all this digital identity management stuff is it's a series of hacks and there's many bad guys working on the other side of it as there are good guys. And I think relative to like when we get all the identity management stuff together and we have a universal ID, the next thing we're going to find on the fraud front is, oh shit, the devil's inside our house. It's actually yeah. the killer's here yeah. and it's yeah. in the browser. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know. the, that's, that, that is, I mean, like, like, I like that one because like, I, I've always said like, the, the biggest problem with why we haven't gotten to unified measurement is we don't want it. 
uh, as an industry. Like we absolutely don't want it. Like, all right, uh, you have two good oranges and three bad oranges, right? And you'd say, if I pay on average $1 per orange, I'm paying five total dollars, and I don't care if the bad oranges are, are crap anyway, so there's the market. The people who supplied you with the good oranges are getting hosed by this, but it keeps the price down overall and profit margins being made on the bad oranges. If all of a sudden we remove those, the price of those two oranges will go up to $5 for the two of them. That's $2.50 per, did that math in my head. Uh, and, but what would happen is there'd be no profit margin on it. So what, what, what the internet really has provided is a release valve to keep pricing down. Remember when I said cost per rating point and cost per ad supported rating point? I think I made this curve steeper in the second part. Do you want to lift like, the pointer? Like the, the, <laughs> yes, very much. But like, that delta between that and what fictional CPM rates are, because like it's not coupled to attention anymore, mm -hmm. that gap is all of the fraud in the marketplace. And it exists on purpose. Lou, <laughs> anything else? Well, I, yeah, um, I, I don't have a fruit analogy, I'm sorry. Um, I think there are three things that need to happen, and all of them are in various states of disarray, right? You've got delivery metrics, was this thing viewable? Did it get in front of a human being? You've got performance metrics. Did it do the thing it was intended to do? And then you've got a, an identity solution, right? I think the thing for me that I'm most focused on, and I think Scott, we might actually be agreeing about this, is that the identity thing is the most important piece, right? We're gonna discuss and debate whether 50% of the pixels on screen uh, for two seconds sound off is the same as a 30 second unit on Fox. Joe has an opinion on that, by the way. Um, I, I, think, I think rational human beings of breathing have an opinion on that. Yeah, right, exactly, and, and, and I'm, I'm with you on that. But you know, I, I think we'll debate that forever, but the thing we've gotta figure out, the thing we've gotta figure out is a high fidelity identity system that works across first and third party um, systems universally, including the walled gardens, which right now today are 50% of the digital impressions that we are, you know, as an industry, consuming and they're not giving us data pass back, which ultimately will become more important than the advertising inventory itself. We will probably trade on data, right? So the walled garden Wrong. thing. Well, okay, you, well you can't, so you <laughs> say that. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Set top box data is fantastic. No, yeah. the, the, send me some of the, that. The, <laughs> the, uh, I think you mail your direct mailing pieces to households, but but the the. Oh. The problem. Oh. The, the, oh. the problem. Oh. Wow. What physical? It's, it's, I had to find something that. older than I had to find something older than TV in order to keep this going. But the, the 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 problem with trading on data is I can have all the data in the world that says that this is the person that that I want to buy my truck. Uh, but if there's no at. reason for the person to watch the ad, like if you think you're going to make an ad that's better than Game of Thrones, it's better than the Americans, it's better than, you're just not. Like, like the fiction that, we'll just make stuff people that, like, I could picture David Ogilvy uh, just saying, I should have just made good ads. That's, uh, that was what we did wrong, guys. We <laughs> totally, we messed up on that one big time. Uh, so like this idea that if we just have enough, people will really like it. Like, I gotta tell you, like this analysis of, if I knew enough about you, I could deliver you the products and services you want. You don't want the products and services. And you know who wants to pay for your time? The services that you don't want. You know who Microsoft wants to advertise to? People like Apple. You know who Crest wants to advertise to? People like Crest. I don't know how many people yeah. really care that much about their toothpaste. Okay. No, but like, that's, sorry, Stanis Florida is the most important ingredient in toothpaste. <laughs> He's doing Crest has your job for so you. We're, we're, so wait, wait, wait. wait. I, I, need to, I, I need to retort. Oh. I'm sorry. So, you know, I, first of all, a couple things. You know, when I say data, disclaimer, when I say data, I give a f about targeting. I'm not here to talk about targeting. Three people on my team do that over there in the room, go talk to them. I am talking about engineering relevance into every interaction. Rashad Tabakawala, the last person on the stage, said, uh, previously, not today, he that people, worried as about people, to people <laughs> buy with their heart and then rationalize that purchase with their head. Did I get that right? Thank you. The heart is not about targeting. The heart is not about anything other than finding a way in to compete for attention. And if we're in an environment where people are moving through our ad product this fast, we've gotta have something that's really, really relevant and resonant. And so this is about playing money ball so that the David Ogilvy's of this world can give us enough variation on creative content so that we can tweak this piece for that person and that piece for this person. Spend a lot of time talking about dynamic creative and you'll understand that this is where we have to go. And it sucks because it's a lot of work and it's messy. But here's the trick, right? The problem now is like, as we would believe, that most of the content is now consumed between Gen X and Gen Y in an app-based environment. 
Those apps, if you look at like Maslow's hierarchy of need, love and self-actualization, apps have replaced Maslow's hierarchy of need. So how are you gonna break through when something is purpose-built to be addictive, and to Rashad's point, the god Rashad, <laughs> is like, if something is purpose-built to be addictive, you're not gonna be able to put an ad against that. It's gonna be interstitial, get away, I just wanna feel like I'm popular right now. So what would David Ogilvy do if he was dealing with an app? Smoke the pipe, see what's in it, <laughs> maybe try to do something creative. So all, all, all this talk about oh, wait, relevance <laughs> and, uh, and all the time about relevance and, and data uh, you know, leads to something that um, you had mentioned uh, in one of our earlier discussions, which was you know, not everything that matters can be measured. And you think you, know, you were saying that a lot of, um, a, a lot of colleagues you know, have a really difficult time wrapping their head around that. What are things that are, you feel just cannot be measured that some people are, out there are, are just desperately trying to figure out a way to measure? I, I, I started with the ROI oh. argument, but I, I struggle. I struggle a lot with um, like this idea of attention. Like, like look, I, I give I give attribution ROI a hard time because I think people think it's supposed to be an input. It's actually supposed to be an output. Like, if you interrupt my show or you put an ad in front of me and I, I spend thirty seconds of time with you, and at the end of said time, I'm like, yeah, I don't really want your product. You better still give me my show. Right, like the market clearing, like we all we're talking about this from a from a perspective of of brands and agencies and, and publishers. But if you take a like, let's all and it just usually makes sense in almost any industry. Let's take a look at it as a viewer, and as a viewer, the market clearing price for thirty seconds of my time is my alternative, which is I could go buy FX Plus for four dollars a month and get rid of commercials. I could go buy Hulu ad free and get rid of commercials. Like the the gauntlet's been thrown down for the I can go get ad blocker. I can. The gauntlet's been thrown down to the industry to say, no, no, we have to get to this if we want to buy people's time, which is the ultimate thing that's not being measured, which is like we should think of attention as, right. as a currency or an oil, and then we trade on that. And then the, you should optimize towards ROI all day long. I just don't know how is attribution without attention possible? Like that's the, there's part of where the fraud is occurring in the system. I'm with, I'm with Joe, I think we need to trade on, uh, start trading on net attention. Like net, net attention is gonna be, you know, and I've been talking to one of my telecom clients, I'm trying to get them to switch from thinking about gross ads to net attention because that's, that's where the game's up. I got it. It just it made, made me chuckle to say that you're trying to get one of your telecom clients to switch. I just pictured the phone call trying to switch services. Sorry. Just me. I just want to be clear that you're not you're not saying it's attention versus attribution because you use them completely different. I might trade on attention, and I think we should. We've mm -hmm. had that conversation, but I still need incremental fractional attribution to understand what parts of what journeys were effective in this customer's ultimate outcome, sure. so I can start to optimize those. So they're. They're, they're sure, but just on what time horizon? So, like, you know, and I give, I, I love the example of the, the Nikes that you know you might buy today, and here's the attribute, here's the, here's some exposures. But what about like when I was like six years old and, and Michael Jordan was being sponsored? But what about what, like where? What's the time horizon on attribution? Because I believe that you know there was a great article that um, says like advertising doesn't work like that. And the point being that like, we don't incept people's minds with ideas, like we create cultural relevance with brands. And I actually do think there'll be, there'll be a culling of like brands that don't survive. And we've started to see it right now. But brands that do survive in a voice activated world and this, like will, will yes, they can use attribution modeling, but they're, they're standing on the back of their brand to do it. No and question. so I don't know I don't what think the anybody would ever argue is. that. I, don't, I think that that is a great discussion point. But oh, I've got, that would argue that. You've got to start somewhere, right? Every campaign I've ever done, there's a ghost awareness before you go out there. People think that they've already seen the ad. They think they've already know the product. So I totally get that. You just you have to look at an attribution window, and you have to make some assumptions about it so that you can measure, optimize, and ultimately rationalize what's happening with your business. Yeah, un un but I think too often though the the players in the attribution game are too much the touch points and not enough the offer or the creative and uh, relative to attribution. We need like. You don't know how uh, probably all of us at this table or at this on the stage mm -hmm. table stage, but <laughs> have collectively face palm more often than we want to talk when it's like the media is not working. You're like, yeah, no, did you pretend that product creative. because the yeah. product a little bit shaky and right. the offer not competitive in the market. Yeah, no, I let's, agree with that. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about audience-based buying. Uh, Joe, last spring, you and Viacom and Turner uh, launched OpenAP, um, you know, it's the standard audience targeting platform. Um, what ha you know, it's it uh, in kind of the early months of that. I you know when the debate last fall. What has that been like? And what has uh, you know trying to get you know buyers and networks on board? What has that kind of experience been like? As you 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 had said you you were doing this in response to buyer requests. So now yeah. that it's out there, are 
Yeah, look, it's, it, it's going well. I mean, it's, it's very early days in terms of, like, I think it's all setting up for where the industry will be. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's an old saying that, you know, skate to where the puck is headed, not where it is. We're going to move towards, like, like, Hulu Live and YouTube TV and other IP-delivered linear streams are going to have a world of possibilities. When that happens, TV should be a platform. Right? So you have, whether you have Google or, or, or Facebook, long form content should be a platform if we're going to still have it as ad supported. Otherwise, we'll just get out of the ad supported business. I will have a lot more free time, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> um, but like, but, but if, it, it's, if we're going to have ad supported long form content, then we need to start setting up to the ability to buy audience across. You know, not to the detriment of building brands culturally, because you want spillover, like, you know, knowing that someone's truck is Ford Tough is only good if also the neighbor knows that it's that and also, so like there, I, I believe that there is this myth, and, and I, don't worry, I'm not saying that you're targeting, but to those three people in a room that over-targeting is a bit of a, is, it's been a negotiation point, and that's been sure. part of the problem. It's like, oh, well, we're, we actually only wanted uh, women between the ages of 17 and uh, 18 and a half. So, uh, so all that other is extra, too bad on you, we're not paying for it. Right. And it's like, well, no, that, that wasn't extra. You, you still had people's time. So I think, it'll, I think there's gonna be a little bit that works backwards from that, but, <coughs> but to be honest, like, we didn't, like, it's not like we founded a company, it's a consortium that others will join. It's just the idea, can we make TV a platform that you can buy more easily kind of across? And then we can compete on everything else. Because the way I, I look at it is like, look, we compete on uh, you know, better shows, better storytelling, better creative, better integrations. But like, if we compete on format or data, like it's toast. We might as well just be ad free. Uh, Scott, how, how has audience-based buying changed your approach to, to TV? I came into uh, to media from the CRM world. And the um, I think the... I would counsel a client to pay more for people that are that are highly likely in market and um, and to play like a CB, like a premium CPM, but then kind of flipping the script on that and thinking about the CRM world, I'm as much interested in hooking up the plumbing around an audience a client's first party solution, and using it to suppress advertising to people that we know aren't market for something, because I think that creates a better ad experience and in a world where we're dealing with you know to Joe's point uh, spiking CPMs because the supply is just not there. I'd rather us use audience-based buying to kind of write good business rules to create a better ad experience so that when we know this is the person we want to talk to or a client wants to talk to, that we're very prescriptive in going after that and delivering the best experience. And that's what kind of excites me about the space. Um, Lou, how about from your perspective? Well, for us, it's been really wonderful. But, you know, we're, Bank of America is kind of unique in that we have eight core lines of business, and they are relevant throughout people's lives, right? Home loans, car loans, checking accounts wealth management, retirement. And so when you can approach a, a, an audience-based buying solution with that in mind and say, okay, I have an opportunity on a product level to be more relevant to this group based on signal with this kind of product and that kind of offer, on a brand story level, another group, you know, another set of narratives, another set of stories, it really allows us to tell the full story uh, versus you know a campaign approach where it's a one-size-fits-all ad, usually at a brand level, and we're hoping that the people who are uh, home loan intenders are going to think home loan, and we're, th we're hoping the people that are credit card intenders are going to think credit card from that ad. So for us, it really is you know an, an extension of where we've already been in trying to put the right offer or the right message into the right household every time. I mean, to Joe's point, we still buy a lot of postage, and this is just nothing more than another channel that we can actually curate better experiences for people. Uh, this is for, for Joe and Scott. You're more of the, the, the newer kids on the block, and you, you just started running Fox, uh, Fox ad sales last May. Hearts and Science has really exploded over the past couple of years. So you have both kind of come in and really tried to shake things up, change things. What has been the, uh, what's been the biggest area of resistance that you've both come across? and your attempts to do that. <laughs> Each other. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that. Right? Uh, I'd say muscle memory um, at the, uh, at, at, on some, with some of the clients that they, um, they know they need and want something new, but there's a lot of muscle memory that drags them back into the past. As, as, uh, as Lou mentioned, the, uh, you know, the cogs coming out of the finance department that are running the media mix models that are doing their forecasting are just really hard to break. Yeah. And um, when you're like, no, dude, that is like, your machine is running and using 1975 technology in the year is 2017, mm -hmm. flying cars, they're like, yes, yeah, son, go back. Go back to where you're from and uh, just deliver me my reach. Well, that's, and, and I think that's the, the, the single biggest problem is language. Um, like this idea of, 
um, okay, cheapest possible reach, C savings, deliver me savings, right? Um, uh, the idea that uh, all things are commodity because in television previously, everything was a 30 second spot. We only started with the gold standard. Had to be, like, I, I, I always joke with people, like people think like a Super Bowl ad is expensive and since it's too late to buy them now, I don't mind selling Linda's stuff for her. Uh, so, so like, but, but like, like let's, let's just hypothetically say it was $5 million for a Super Bowl ad. I would, I, would, I would be willing to bet $20 million that no one can deliver me the reach of a Super Bowl ad and I'll give you a year to do it. And what you'd have to do, it, no, what you'd have to do is, here, here's the rule, 100% of the screen, sight, sound, motion on, viewed to completion, 100 million uniques. Unless you roadblock Facebook or YouTube, which neither will roadblock Facebook or YouTube, it's garbage. I mean, there's no way. It, do, it does not exist. People do not, like, think about how many people have watched an ad, sight, sound, motion to completion in the United States. Like, so, so the, so I'm the. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> and if so, no, no. who no, answers? Yeah. Joe no. answers. No, the, 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 the answer, the question was, like, what, what's the struggle? And the struggle is language. Like, that's called reach, even though it's not. All things are not the same anymore. All things are not commodity anymore. And so I can make a product that's 50% better and charge 25% more price, and there's no way for him to buy it, really, because it just looks more expensive. In every other industry, that would make perfect sense. All right, well, when we're talking about product, products that might be 50% better and 25% or more price, let's talk about six second ads, which you rolled out uh, this, this last year as well, or at least moved from, from digital to linear. Uh, what has, you know, it started on, I think, Teen Choice Awards, and then you rolled it out into sports over yep. the, now we're seeing other networks pick it up as well. AMC is running them, NBC is going to run them in the Olympics. Yep. What, um, again, when we were talking about struggles, what were those initial conversations like trying to get people to think about you it, know, six seconds as opposed to 15, 30? It was Exactly, it was exactly that. The, a 30 second spot in the middle of a five ad ad pod has a price, right? And then we had a six second spot where the pitcher is walking back up to the pitcher mound and coming back, perfect attention transfer, just intuitively. Like my mother knows nothing about advertising. She goes, that's a great ad, I saw that ad. And so we said, okay, the price of this ad in this placement will be X. And the very first reaction from like agency partners, and, and again, this is not their fault, this is a procurement problem, we can't pay you for six what we used to pay for 15. But that's like, like, think about real estate. That'd be like saying, I can't pay for 600 square feet in Manhattan what I used to pay for 1,500 square feet in the suburbs. Cool, don't move to Manhattan. But like this idea, <laughs> this idea of thinking about, about media in one dimension breaks everything. Like you should think of it like real estate. Square footage is time. Uh, uh, location is location, and hence why we have all the problems with the, with the mythical fictional long tail. And, and then you have uh, this idea of amenities. You know, you'd like to know if your house has a roof. Does it have water, right? That would be for TV, that would be sound, interaction, et cetera. So I, I think if we dimensionalize media, it'll actually change the game, and that will get us more to the attention. And Scott, what, what are these, what, what does six second ads open up for you? The, I think the, this is a muscle memory problem. I think it, the machination, first thing is like, okay, can we, uh, has it been proven yet that we can actually deliver something that's resonant in a six second period? Depends on the brand, depends on how long the brand's been in it. Is it right for introducing something versus you know, reinforcing something that's still TBD? But I think relative to the muscle memory of how media mix models and agency works and client work, I mean, the same effect that, got, that hit agencies relative to media procurement and CPMs hit the production on the creative agency side. And they have a real hard time, like, you know, if you were to span six second ads, 15, 30s, apps, this app, that app, Snapchat, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, all of them are different. They don't have the resources to produce against that palette. And so what we're hoping for, I think, is that if we can do some better stuff on like the shrink the audience, pay more for it, but it'll cost you a little bit less, but don't take it to the bottom line, invest in more creative production so that it actually fits within the format of the ad. Um, hopefully we'll get there. It's just gonna take a while to break the muscle memory of like gross ads, you know, then they go into the funnel when you're like thinking about cross-selling, upselling, share of household, and like a palette of creative options that fit the format. All right, um, Lou, we were talking a little bit before about walled gardens, which I think will come up a lot this uh, today. But um, how do you get around kind of the data and the transparency issues when so much of the, the data and the, int you know, the information you're after is still kind of closed off? Or how, how do you piece that together on your own? So on six second ads, what I really like about them from a narrative standpoint, I'm not the wall garden guy, remember? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but no, I do want to take a moment and, and talk about six second ads. I like to say, that the future of advertising is great stories well told. And I think that six second ads are a really interesting canvas for narrative. If you think about every great book you ever wrote, read, it's chapterized. 
and you can do things with six second ads sequentially, episodically, that keep the audience engaged and sort of in a subconscious way kind of demonstrate that you respect what they're doing, whether they're binge watching on VOD or if it's high profile like, you know, the World Series. It wasn't your mom that called you and said that. It was me, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> I love the, I, I love the fact that I was confused. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant to She's see She's going to like second. it, yeah, I right. got it. <laughs> so, but anyhow, I know there's a walled garden question here for one of you two guys. I'm yeah. not going there. <laughs> No, like I, I think that the the look I I I think everything has its role in place. I think the the the, the narrative forever has been okay. TV dollars are going to move. TV dollars are going to move. The reason TV dollars don't move is it's it's video advert, sight, sound, motion advertising. Like you know, I've said forever. Like you know, Lou was talking earlier about well, we just have to get the content mix right because if you're in this environment where people are scrolling through, it's got to be right and resonant. And, and I remember being in a room full of advertisers once, and someone said that about, uh, and someone from one of the walled gardens said that, it's got to be up to you to make the content in engaging enough that someone wants to watch it. And I was like, well, okay, if I made all the ads skippable on Fox starting tomorrow on VOD, all ads are skippable after a second, but you all have to be willing to pay for it still. Cool? <laughs> Dead silence, just like that. And it was a room full of marketers. And the reason being that like, like TV, TV, look, it, it, has a lot of sins of its own creation, right, in terms of ad load and how it did it and so forth. But it started at the top, right, and now it's like it's, it can only go downhill. And like digital starts at like, well, one second's viewable, half second's viewable, two seconds is viewable, and now it can go up. You want to buy 30 seconds of viewable ads on, on one of those platforms? You can. It's like an $80 CPM, $100 CPM. I don't even know what it's at right now if you want to try to get an average of 30 seconds in view. Right. We start there, and everything's a discount to it. And that's kind of the problem we're stuck in. Did you have anything else to add, Scott? It, I was going to answer your walled garden okay. question, but yeah. I can yeah. take a pass. No, no, okay. All right. Well, um, I think um, you know we we have to wrap things up shortly. But I always like to end these panels talking about uh, current events that uh, that 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 talk uh, that I'll touch give you on an one exclusive. Of these. <laughs> um, but uh, so Bank of America was pretty quiet yesterday. Hearts and Science pretty quiet yesterday. Fox, uh, all of a sudden, uh, is going to land Thursday Night Football for the next five years. And, that sounds uh, fun. A couple billion, uh, shelled out for that. So now the spotlight goes to you. And what, what, wh how, what do you think about uh, that? And how are you going to kind of maybe incorporate some of the stuff we talked today about how you're going to go and sell that? Well, we did. I mean, look, we did uh, with the Thanksgiving game this year. We, we did the first time where we did live production of six-second ads into the ads. Like I, I joke about six-second ads are like the Mini Coopers in the Italian job. They use the those cars because they fit. Um, same thing with six second ads. Like it's hard to put a thirty second ad when like there's a break in the action, but you can fit a six second. Um, but more interestingly, sports are live produced, and we have artificial breaks where the commercials are. What if we could do more natural breaks when there's a lull in the action ad? And so like we have the best sports production team. Like when you watch one of the games. So what if we start more live producing ads into it? So we'll see a lot more of that um, in that game, unnoticeable to a, an average consumer. But we had nine six-second ads, um, and we actually took out two minutes and 30 seconds of ad breaks. We actually cut the ad load in half for that break with those sixes. A little hard to manage it in, but you'll see, you'll see more of that uh, this year. We do look at uh, the streaming. We'll see a lot of uh, data targeted. But um, you know, Thursday night's a great night to buy if you want people shopping over the weekend. So see me after it if there's marketers in the room. <laughs> We got, we got about we got a billion dollars to make up. And, uh, and Lou, I'm going to give you the, the greatest gift of all, which is the last word of the oh boy. No. Show. Plastics. Well, uh, with regard to news? With regard to... And, and you know, I, I think it's an exciting year to be in the business that we're in, right? I mean, the rules are changing rapidly, and it seems chaotic, and there's proliferation of everything. But at the end of the day, we're migrating away from this sort of what Rob Norman calls forced viewing economy, where people have to endure the crap we make. And instead now, we're actually being forced to really think about the customer experience and produce things that they want, that are shareworthy, that they, they find value in, that you know, engage them and hopefully think differently about their, you know, our brands. And you know, I, I think for many of us, those kinds of things are why we got into this business. And it's a really exciting time because the work we're doing today is probably gonna set the bar for the next 30 or 40 or 50 years, right? We're migrating from one to many to one to one. Whether or not, you know, it happens in one year or three years or five years or maybe never, um, you know, we're gonna get there. And, and, and it's an, I, I would just say, this is a great time to really experiment, 
to really keep your eyes and a prize on what it is we're trying to do to get people to think differently about the world around them, our good, our service, our product, or our brand, inspire them, and, and cultivate a relationship over time, and stop trying to optimize yield and, and chase down the funnel of low-cost CPMs. Lou for president. All right. Uh, nice. Second. Um, all right. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. So thank you to thank you. Joe and Lou and Scott. No worries. Thanks thank to all of you, too. Um, thank you.